Section 67 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams, Allen, and S.C. Ferguson. Section 67. Single Life. In the minds of nearly all properly constituted individuals, there exists the hope and expectation of marriage. This is in accordance with the law of God as written in our physical being, and the young man who marries not, save in a few exceptional cases, arising out of ill health, deformity, or eccentricity of character, fails in one of the most palpable duties of life. He deprives himself of life's most refined and exalted pleasures, of some of its strongest incentives to virtue and activity, sets an example unworthy of imitation, and fails to do much good that he might do in society. Moreover, he leaves one who might have made him a happy and useful companion to pine in maidenhood of heart through all the weary days of life. A single life is not without its advantages, while a married one that fails in accomplishing its true end is the acme of earthly wretchedness. It is eminently proper to prepare for marriage, since this is designed by the Almighty Author to promote the health, happiness, purity, and real greatness of our species. But it is an error to fancy that you cannot be truly happy in a single state, or hastily to assume the responsibilities of married life without due consideration. There is many a wife who, having married hastily and with a lack of due caution, has buried her hopes even of happiness deep in a grave of despair and many a man who married without due thought and consideration can date from that hour the death of his ambitious purposes and in the disappointments of married life lose sight of the glorious hopes which inspired him while single if the greatest happiness and perhaps the only real and genuine kind is to be found in the blessings of chaste and devoted love yet matrimony it must be acknowledged is chargeable with numberless solicitudes and responsibilities and if it often causes the heart to exult in joy, it as frequently makes it throb with pain. If it does not fall to your lot to participate in the delights and pleasures of a happy and reciprocal union of hearts, if destiny has restricted your sympathies and thwarted your desires, and consigned you, perhaps unwillingly, to solitude and celibacy, if you are only a neutral spectator of those scenes wherein great artifice and deception, unfairness and insecurity are too often practised, and often hearts are won, but happiness is lost, you may console yourself that there are many positive advantages in being alone. The command of time and freedom from many cares should open the way to new and beneficial sources of pastime, and usefulness sufficient to reconcile you to your condition, and to make it as enviable as that of those who have more encumbrances but less ease, and who sometimes act as if the world was made for matrimony and nothing else. From the actions and conversations of some people, you would suppose that marriage was the chief end of life, which view is altogether degrading and debasing in its tendency. For while admitting that it is, indeed, that state of life most becoming the dignity and happiness of man, Yet it is not true that single life does not present fields of usefulness and honor, and that, above all things, it is true wisdom to remain single to the end of your days, unless you are satisfied that it is advisable to unite your destiny with that of another. Marriage has a great refining and moralizing tendency. When a man marries early and uses prudence in choosing a suitable companion, he is likely to lead a virtuous, happy life. But in an unmarried state all alluring vices have a tendency to draw him away. Marriage renders a man more virtuous and more wise. An unmarried man is but half of a perfect being, and it requires the other half to make things right, and it cannot be expected that in this imperfect state he can keep straight in the path of rectitude any more than a boat with one oar can keep a straight course. Marriage changes the current of a man's feelings, and gives him a centre for his thoughts, his affections, and his acts. There are exceptions to every rule but the chances are that the young man who marries will make a stronger and better fight all through life than he who remains single. The reason for this is not difficult to find. A man will not put forth all his energies who has not something outside of himself to draw on and to incite him to put forth his best exertions. He also feels the lack of a home, which tends to round out life. He may indeed have a place to eat, a place to sleep, and, for that matter, all the luxury that money can buy— 
but we have long since learned that money will not buy everything it is utterly beyond its power to purchase a home and the treasures of love this the unmarried man cannot obtain he may be courted for his money he may eat drink and revel and he may sicken and die in a hotel or a garret with plenty of attendants around him but alas what are attendants waiting like so many cormorants for their prey as compared with those whose hearts are knit to him by the strong ties of family relationship if marriage increases the cares it also heightens the pleasures of life if it in some instances dampens the enthusiasm and seems a hindrance to success in countless instances it has proved to be the incentive which has called forth the best part of man's nature roused him from selfish apathy and inspired in him those generous principles and high resolves which have caused all his after-life to be replete with kindly acts and himself to develop into a character known loved and honoured by all within the sphere of his influence jeremy taylor in contrasting single life with married life says in his quaint style marriage is a school an exercise of virtue and though marriage hath cares yet single life hath desires which are more troublesome and more dangerous and often end in sin while the cares are but exercises of piety and therefore if single life hath more privacy of devotion yet marriage hath more variety of it and is an exercise of more grace marriage is the proper scene of piety and patience and the duty of parents and the charity of relations here kindness is spread abroad and love is united and made firm as a centre marriage is the nursery of heaven the virgin sends prayers to god but she carries but one soul to him but the state of marriage fills up the number of the elect and hath in it the labour of love and the delicacies of friendship the blessings of society and the union of hearts and hands it hath in it more safety than single life hath it hath more care it hath more merry and more sad it is fuller of joys and sorrows it lies under more burdens but it is supported by all the strength of love and charity which makes those burdens delightful marriage is the mother of the world and preserves kingdoms and fills cities and churches and heaven itself and is that state of good things to which god hath designed the present constitution of the world though a great deal can be urged against marriage at too early an age or against hasty and injudicious marriages still there arrives a time in the life of every individual when it would be a great deal wiser for him to marry than to remain single and we suppose that the number of bachelors who remain single all their life is exceedingly small comparatively few of them die unmarried when least expected they contract matrimonial alliances thereby oftentimes disappointing numerous proteges who have been confidently expecting that they would come in for the property and the chances are against such marriages being happy for it is more of convenience both on his part and that of his wife she probably takes him because he is wealthy and can provide her with a first-rate establishment he probably marries her because he is insufferably lonely and wishes to have a home of his own where if he cannot do everything as he likes he is certain of a real welcome though many of the most pathetic sorrows of life are caused by the endearing relations existing by marriage between the suffering one and another yet deep in the heart of many who walk through life alone unattended by the sympathy of a loving companion lies deeply buried from the human eyes some of the deepest and most soul-pervading griefs that humanity knows of perhaps that old man now so cross and fretful whom we call old bachelor even now has a mistiness come in his eye and a pathetic tremor in his tongue as he looks at a faded picture to him too sacred for the curious gaze of others a picture whose limning has faded as the real one faded long ago under the coffin lid and there are no doubt many whom we call selfish proud cold-hearted men who were once as warm-hearted and generous as any could wish who once poured out all the wealth of their affections on one unworthy of them the discovery of which changed their whole nature there are women whom the world calls single who are as truly wedded to a tear-stained package as if it really were the being it represents to them who live in the old sweet time those missives once belonged to and who keep their hearts apart from the dull reality that makes up the present world years may have passed and nothing remains the same except the dear dream that never knew reality yet held in their love life by their fragile paper bonds they still dwell in that fair unsubstantial springtime while autumn fades and winter cold and dreary reigns in all the outer world.
End of section 67. Section 68 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Langston. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 68. Married Life. The marriage institution is the bond of social order, and if treated with due respect, care, and consideration, greatly enhances individual happiness and consequently general good. The Spartan law punished those who did not marry, those who married too late, and those who married improperly. Though positive law has long since ceased to exercise any discretion as to whether a person marries or remains single, yet as the foundation of marriage is fixed in the law of God, written in our physical being, it follows that it is none the less true now than in the morning of time that it is not good for man to be alone. For ages history has shown that the permanent union of one man with one woman establishes a relation of affection and interest which can in no other way be made to exist between two human beings. Hence marriage, both from a theoretical and a practical point of view, becomes to him an aid in the stern conflicts of life. Many a man has risen from obscurity to fame, who in the days of his triumphant victory has freely and gracefully acknowledged that to the sympathy and encouragement of his wife during the long and weary years of toil he owed very much of his achieved success. The good wife! How much of this world's happiness and prosperity is contained in the compass of these two short words? Her influence is immense. The power of a wife for good or for evil is altogether irresistible. Home must be the seat of happiness, or it must be forever unknown. A good wife is to a man wisdom and courage, strength and endurance. A bad one is confusion and weakness, discomfiture and despair. No condition in life is hopeless when the wife possesses firmness, decision, energy, and economy. There is no outward prosperity which can counteract indolence, folly, and extravagance at home. No spirit can long resist bad domestic influences. Man is strong, but his strength is not adamant. He delights in enterprise and action, but to sustain him he needs a tranquil mind and a whole heart. He expends his moral force in the conflicts of the world. In the true wife, the husband finds not affection only, but companionship, a companionship with which no other can compare. The family relationship gives retirement with solitude, and society without the rough intrusion of the world. It plants in the husband's dwelling a friend who can bear his silence without weariness, who can listen to the details that affect his interests or sympathy, who can appreciate his repetition of events, only important as they are embalmed in the heart. Common friends are linked to us by a slender thread. We must reclaim them by ministering to their interests or their enjoyments. What a luxury it is for a man to feel that in his home there is a true and devoted being, in whose presence he may throw off restraint without danger to his dignity, he may confide without fear of treachery, and be poor or unfortunate without fear of being abandoned. If in the outer world he grows weary of human selfishness, his heart can safely trust in one whose indulgence overlooks his defects. The treasure of a wife's affection, like the grace of God, is given, not bought. Gold is power. It can sweep down forests, raise cities, build roads and deck houses, but wealth cannot purchase love and the affections of a wife. If any husband has failed to estimate the affections of a true wife, he will be likely to mark their value in his loss when the heart that loved him is stilled by death. Is man the child of sorrow, and do afflictions and distresses pour their bitternesses into his cup? How are his trials alleviated, his sighs suppressed, his corroding thoughts dissipated, his anxieties and fears relieved, his gloom and depression chased away by her cheerfulness and love? Is he overwhelmed by disappointments and mortified by reproaches? There is one who can hide his faults from her eyes and can love without upbraiding. A judicious wife is constantly exerting an influence for good over her husband. She is, so to speak, the wielder of the moral pruning knife, 
and is constantly snipping off from her husband's moral nature little twigs that are growing in the wrong direction intellectual beings of different sexes were surely intended by their creator to go through the world thus together united not only in hand and heart but in principles in intellect in views and in dispositions each pursuing one common and noble end their own improvement and the happiness of those around them by the different means appropriate to their situation mutually correcting sustaining and strengthening each other undergraded by all practices of tyranny on the one hand and deceit on the other each finding a candid but severe judge in the understanding and a warm and partial advocate in the heart of their companion a great deal has been said in a cynical way about the immense number of unhappy marriages there is so much said on this subject that it is easy to forget that for every instance of complaint there are thousands of beneficent and prosperous unions of which the world never hears it is natural that the evil attracts the most attention men and women whose married life is full of good and helpfulness do not often feel an impulse to defend the system under which they live sometimes we hear both sexes repine at their change relate the happiness of their earlier years blame the folly and rashness of their own choice and warn others against the infatuation but it is to be remembered that the days which they so much wish to call back are the days not only of celibacy but of youth the days of novelty and of improvement of ardor and of hope of health and vigor of body of gaiety and lightness of heart it is not easy to surround life with any circumstances in which youth will not be delightful and we are afraid that whether married or single we shall find the vesture of terrestrial existence more heavy and cumbersome the longer it is worn it is human to see only the good side of anything that is past and gone life is so full of disappointments that whenever in mature years we recall past days our present state being present reality always suffers by comparison with the past it would be well to calmly reflect on what happiness in married life depends there is a great deal of mischief wrought in the world by the common understanding of the phrase mismated many apparently act as if all the ills of married life could be explained by a convenient use of that word it is arrogant folly to suppose that so much misery and wrong so much selfishness and cruelty so much that is low animal and unlovely in the lives of men and women results from their being mismated they have in the majority of cases mistaken the cause of their trouble these men and women are undeveloped exacting selfish proud they have undisciplined tempers and they are accustomed to think of happiness for themselves as the chief end of marriage no magic of mating would make the lives of such people very high or perfect nowhere does it prove so powerfully true as in married life that your happiness is found in consulting the happiness of another we are too prone to trust to specific treatment for particular evils the real problem of happiness in married life is not difficult of solution if only sought with a spirit of willingness to learn the truths there are no short roads to happiness the men and women who marry must somehow acquire thoughtfulness self-control consideration for others patience and the other qualities without which life is unendurable in any relations we know of all candid persons will so readily admit this that marriage speedily becomes a school for the exercise of virtue and is the source and nurse of many of the best qualities in the life of man or woman it is indeed wonderful that marriage does so much for them and has such power to lift up their lives to light and beauty the man who remains single to the end of his days cannot well help growing cynical cold and selfish by nature he may be as warm-hearted as full of generous impulses as any but he has only himself to care for he has never felt the necessity of striving to make happy the life of another he has never known what it is to have a woman's heart full of womanly tenderness and strength affection sympathy and encouragement looking to him for love and happiness for protection and comfort has never learned the lesson of patience as it is learned in bearing with the faults of a loved one he has never known what it is to have a little child turn to him as the source of consolation for its childish troubles and sorrows it cannot but follow that lacking all the bittersweet experience of married life he shall in that degree fail of being a complete man true there are natures that whether married or single 
would only develop into the cold, hard-hearted disposition. But that does not at all detract from the fact that marriage does thus tend to make life more replete with kindness and manly attributes than celibacy. Every man feels the need of a home, and there is no more sorrowful sight than to see a man bent with the weight of years who is homeless and has no friends united to him by family ties. There cannot be a home without the institution of marriage. Think for a moment how much of the joy and sorrow of life is connected with the word home. What visions of hopes, what days of joy, what seasons of sorrow does it not recall? All the lights and shades of life originate from thence. How, then, can a man or woman lacking the experience of home and married life possess the strength of character, the full and complete development, expected from those who have taken upon themselves the joys and sorrows, the cross and crown of matrimony? End of section 68 Recording by Laura Langston Section 69 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S.C. Ferguson. Section 69. Duties of Married Life. Happiness in life is of such momentous importance that it becomes all to study well the conditions of happiness, and to none does this truth apply itself with greater force than to those who have taken upon themselves the duties of matrimony. It is vain and useless now to ponder the wisdom and propriety of the choice. The step has been taken, and it only remains now to take up the duties thus voluntarily assumed, and, in the due performance of the same, to do what is in their power to gather the happiness with which God, in His goodness, has vested the marriage relation." Husbands and wives should learn to live happily together, for the lesson can be learned. By living happily together we do not understand a calm, passive existence, unbroken by a single dissenting word or look, because persons are incapacitated for happiness who can adapt themselves to such an impotent existence. Occasional differences of opinion indicate mutual vitality, and, when backed by common sense and self-control, are no drawbacks to a peaceful life but in all vital points of mutual interest husband and wife should agree perfectly understanding that their interests are mutual and that in every sense of the word they are one life is real and our everyday wants and desires remain the same after as before marriage all the infirmities of our nature must still be fought against the marriage ceremony does not do away with the necessity of self-control the passions still have to be subdued and a careful watch maintained against hasty words and actions Many, in failing to recognize these truths, are laying the foundation for future unhappiness. It is so easy to imagine that the loved one is all perfection, and when the soul is filled with the sweet influence of love, it is so easy to think that this is sufficient for all the ills of life, that now these two harps of a thousand strings will henceforth always be attuned to each other, and thus, ignoring the fact that human nature is extremely frail, forget to strengthen it by the exercise of reflection and judgment, fail to summon to their aid consideration and a disposition to bear and forbear, suddenly awaken to the fact that life has ever its trials, and that, for the busiest day, some duty waits. They then learn that happiness comes only as the result of persistent following in the paths of duty, that no ceremony or rite can change their nature, that the plain rules of courtesy and kindness, consideration and respect, are as necessary now as in the springtime of love. Love on both sides, and all things equal in outward circumstances, are not all the requisites of domestic felicity. Young people seldom court in their everyday dress, but they must put it on after marriage, as in other bargains, but few expose defects. They are apt to marry faultless. Love is blind, but faults are there, and will come out. The fastidious attentions of wooing are like spring flowers. They make pretty nosegays, but poor greens. The beautiful romance with which so many have invested the morning time of wedded life is apt to wear off under the burden and heat of its noon. That this should not be so, all will admit. That wedded love, like the river running to the ocean, should grow in magnitude as it rolls through life, should, no doubt, be the result of all well-lived matrimonial lives. But, from the constitution and nature of man, such, unfortunately, is not always the case." 
the honeymoon at times gets an unexpected dash of vinegar and at last it disappears altogether in the prosaic duties of home life this is the trying hour of married life between the parties there can be no more illusions the deceptions of courtship are no longer of avail right here is the chance to make or mar the happiness of life why not look the matter plainly in the face why not recognize the fact that life is not romance it is a real thing and altogether too precious to be thrown away in secret regrets or open indifference it is your duty now to begin the duty or adaptation if you have neglected to study the conditions of happiness heretofore begin at once to do so if you have been derelict in duty resolve to do your share now if you find you do not love each other as you thought you did double your attentions to each other and be zealous of anything which tends in the slightest way to separate you acknowledge your faults to one another and determine that henceforth you will be all in all to each other there is no other way for you to do it it is not too late for you to look for happiness you are yet young it is folly to expect naught but disappointment the rest of your life the fault is in human nature and like most faults has a remedy it is well to study for the remedy for the man or woman who has settled down on the conviction that he or she is attached for life to an uncongenial mate and that there is no way of escape has lost life and there is no effort too costly to make which can restore the missing pearl to its setting upon the bosom no doubt much of the happiness of married life would be saved if only the sober views of life and duty were more carefully considered before marriage if only every couple would consider that over against every joy stands a duty and that tears and smiles alternate with each other through life they would save themselves much disappointments it is not too late however to begin and so if this truth be not recognized before marriage do not delay an instant when once stern facts have withdrawn the pleasing illusions with which an untaught fancy invests matrimony and life with its duties as well as its pleasures appears to your view it has always seemed to us that much of the danger of home life springs from its familiarity that in the intimate relations of husband and wife the parties are too apt to forget the claims of courtesy which are constantly pressing upon them while there should be no strictness of formal etiquette between the parties it is none the less true that since life is made up of forms and ceremonies and much of the pleasure of life depend on the due observance of the same that a spirit of courtesy should constantly exist between husband and wife before marriage each would be cautious of a breach of manners and would strive to demean themselves as become ladies and gentlemen are not the claims of courtesy just as pressing now as ever has the marriage ceremony given you any right to be less than polite and in a still higher sense when you reflect that true courtesy is ever accompanied by the spirit of kindness and dignity of carriage the more pressing are its claims it is difficult to conceive of any station in life where the exercise of patience is not imperatively demanded all life is effectually teaching and emphasizing this lesson of patience but marriage affords a field where too great an importance cannot be attached to it its claims are fresh every morning and new every evening and it were difficult to conceive of anything which had more to do with home happiness than bearing patiently the innumerable vexations which are constantly thrown in your path every couple paired flatter themselves that their experience will be better and more excellent than that of many who have gone before them they look with amazement at the coldness complainings and dissatisfaction which spoil the comfort of so many homes as at things which cannot by any possibility fall to their happier lot but like causes produce like effects and to avoid the misfortune of others we must avoid their mistakes the acquaintance of courtship is a very one-sided affair both parties seeing through the peculiar atmosphere which magnifies virtue changes defects into beauties and makes the discovery of faults impossible the discovery will certainly come and those who had thought each other next to perfection will soon discover that some few imperfections and the common weaknesses of humanity remain disappointment is felt where there is no just reason for it they had thought they were perfectly adapted to each other and that mutual concessions would involve no self-denial and that whatever either desired the other would instantly yield but experience teaches that the work of mutual adaptation is precisely what they have to learn to understand each other's peculiarities and tastes weaknesses and excellencies and by self-discipline and kindness of construction on both sides to receive and impart a modifying influence bringing them near to each other all the time 
until through this interchangeable moral and spiritual culture the hopes of happiness are fully realized but this happy result which is unquestionably the highest earth affords depends in a great degree upon the manner in which the first few years of married life are spent and the success with which its first unavoidable trials are met and overcome some allow themselves to lose sight of the great truth that happiness is surest found in consulting the happiness of others the husband should have as his great object and rule of conduct the happiness of his wife of that happiness the confidence in his affection is the chief element and the proofs of this affection on his part therefore constitute his chief duty an affection that shows itself not in caresses alone as if those were the only demonstration of love but of that respect which distinguishes love as a principle from that brief passion which assumes and only assumes the name a respect which consults the judgment as well as the wishes of the object beloved which considers her who is worthy of being taken to heart as worthy of being admitted to all the counsels of the head do not forget that your happiness both here and hereafter depends upon each other's influence an unkind word or look or an unintentional neglect sometimes lead to thoughts which ripen into the ruin of body and soul a spirit of forbearance patience and kindness and a determination to keep the chain of love bright are likely to develop corresponding qualities and to make the rough places of life smooth and pleasant have you seriously reflected that it is in the power of either of you to make the utter utterly miserable and when the storms and trials of life come for come they will how much either of you can do to calm to elevate to purify the troubled soul of the other and change clouds for sunshine it is emphatically the duty of all who have entered into marriage to strive to forget self and in furthering the happiness of the other to advance their own ever remembering that even though attended with the fairest of outward prospects infirmity is inseparably bound up with your very nature and that in bearing one another's burdens you are fulfilling one of the highest duties of the union love in marriage cannot subsist unless it be mutual and where love cannot be there can be left of wedlock nothing but the empty husk of an outside matrimony as undelightful and as unpleasing to god as any other kind of hypocrisy end of section 69section 70 of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by marianne the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section 70 trials of married life we celebrate the wedding and make merry over the honeymoon the poet paints the beauties and blushes of the blooming bride and the bark of matrimony with its freight of untested love is launched on the sea of experiment amid kind wishes and rejoicing but on that precious sea are many storms and even the calm has its perils and only when the bark has weathered these and landed its cargo in the haven of domestic peace can we pronounce the voyage prosperous and congratulate on their merited and enviable reward as long as human nature is what it is we must expect that life of any kind will abound in trials to conceive of a life utterly devoid of these is to conceive of a vegetative kind of existence trials then are to be expected and they must be overcome this is none the less true of married life marriages may be celebrated in bowers as fair as those of eden but they must be proved and put to the test in the workshops of the world and as each state of existence has its peculiar trials and cares we need not be disappointed when experience teaches that though marriage hath indeed great joys it also has its trials and vexations in prosaic everyday life romantic minds are speedily sobered down and the gloss of pretension is soon worn off hands that have heretofore seen no harder work than to entice strains of music from ivory keys perhaps find themselves engaged in the less poetical but equally as praiseworthy occupation of mixing bread or in the performance of other plain household duties which require to be dispatched not by angels but by women and the possessor of faultless clothes and silken moustache finds himself weighed down with altogether different burdens than those of holding fans and carrying parasols and he is called upon to solve other questions than those relating to social etiquette courtship 
is to many a dreamy resting place betwixt the joys of youth and the cares of maturity under the light of hope married life is nearly always a land of rainbows to the youth but as to produce the rainbow it requires the falling of rain as well as the shining sun so when the nature of these prospective joys is carefully investigated it will not surprise one to find that trials and duties are interposed between their present standpoint and the pure happiness of domestic life to many a young couple when life's realities come come also the discovery of traits of character in each other which perfectly astonish them every day reveals something new and something unpleasant the courtship character slowly fades away and with sorrow be it said too often the courtship love as well now comes the disappointment sorrow regret they find that their characters are entirely dissimilar they also awake to the fact that married life is full of cares vexations and disappointments this indeed should have been expected but it is human to see naught but joys in the future especially from the standpoint of youth this discovery often shipwrecks the happiness of the unfortunate couple we have all seen the trees die in summer time but the tree with its whispering leaves and swaying limbs its greenness its umbrage where the shadows lie hidden all the day does not die all at once first a dimness creeps over its brightness next a leaf sickens here and there and fades next a whole bough feels the palsying touch of coming death and finally the feeble signs of sickly life visible here and there all disappear and the dead trunk holds out its stripped stark limbs a melancholy ruin just so does the wedded love sometimes die wedded love blessed with the prayers of friends hallowed by the sanction of god rosy with present joys and radiant with future hopes it dies not all at once a hasty word casts a shadow upon it and the shadow deepens with the sharp reply a little thoughtlessness misconstrued a little unintentional negligence deemed real a little word misinterpreted through such small channels do dissension and sorrow enter the family circle love becomes reticent confidence is chilled and noiselessly but surely the work of separation goes on until the two are left as isolated as the pyramids nothing remaining of the union but the legal form the dead trunk of the tree whose branches once waved in the sunlight is it not a melancholy reflection on human nature that petty trials and difficulties from which no life is free should have wrought such a startling effect the great secret is to learn to bear with each other's failings not to be blind to them that were either an impossibility or a folly we must see and feel them if we do neither they are not evils to us and there is obviously no need of forbearance we are to throw the mantle of charity around them concealing them from the curious gaze of others to determine not to let them chill the affections surely it is not the perfections but the imperfections of human character that make the strongest claims on our love all the world must approve and even enemies must admire the good and estimable in human nature if a husband and wife estimate only that in each other all must be constrained to value what do they more than others it is the infirmities of character imperfections of nature that call for pitying sympathy the tender compassion that makes each the comforter the monitor of the other forbearance helps each to attain command over themselves this forbearance is not a weak and wicked indulgence of each other's faults but such a calm tender observation of them as excludes all harshness and anger and takes the best and fullest method of pointing them out in the full confidence of affection it should be remembered that trials and sufferings are the real test of merit in all life as they bring out the real character in married life husband and wife are often adapted to each other through trials and the closest union is often wrought by suffering even as iron is welded by heat as much of happiness of real life is artificial so many things in wedded life that to third persons must seem as trials are after all only the sweetness of domestic life how many couples now in mature life and surrounded by luxury and all the comforts of wealth look back to the days of early privation as amongst the happiest days of their life succeeding years have brought them wealth but it took with them their domestic happiness marriage is too frequently the end instead of the beginning of love the dreams of courtship vanish too often into thin air soon after the wedding ring is put on 
the realization of that perfect and unalloyed happiness that each partner anticipated is seldom found in the holy bonds of matrimony cool and distant with a feeling that the sweet courtesies of wooing time are now out of place they treat each other with the indifference that ends in mutual aversion and contempt this is altogether wrong as reasoning men and women they have entered the relation it is vain to suppose it is one of unmixed delights it has its trials you must expect to meet them the conditions of happiness there are much the same as elsewhere therefore the only sure way of finding it is to forget self in the furtherance of the happiness of others the trials of wedded life are seen to be but the approaches to its joys once the spirit of kindly forbearance is spread abroad in the heart it must seem to all who seriously meditate on this subject that many of the trials of married life arise from mistaken notions of economy and the right use of money every wife knows her husband's income or ought to know it that knowledge should be the guide of her conduct a clear understanding respecting the domestic expenses is necessary to the peace of every dwelling if it be little better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith if it be ample let it be enjoyed with all thankfulness partners in privation are more to each other than partners in wealth those who have suffered together love more than those who have rejoiced together where a wife seeing her duty has made up her mind to this she will brighten her little home with smiles that will make it a region of perpetual sunshine we account these two things essential to the happiness of married life to have a home of your own and to live distinctly and honestly within your means a great proportion of the failures in wedlock may be traced directly to the neglect of the latter rule no man can feel happy or enjoy the sweets of domestic life who is spending more than he earns no sensible person will account it a hardship to begin on a moderate scale and those who do thus begin and afterwards attain to the possession of wealth always look back to the days of small things with peculiar satisfaction as the golden days of their hearts if not of their purses true affection delights in the opportunities of self-denial and in the little acts of personal service for which there is scarcely any place in the house of the rich at the shrine of domestic ambition much of the comfort and happiness of home life is immolated and for the sake of appearance happiness and content are exchanged for wearying cares to regulate our expenses by other people's income is the height of folly and to contract debts for a style of living which is of our neighbour's choosing rather than our own is nearly akin to insanity there is no happiness social domestic or individual without independence and no dependence is so bitter as that of debt and when you reflect how needless this is you can readily see that in this instance as in many others the trials are of our own choosing and might be avoided by consideration and care end of section seventy section number seventy one of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the golden gems of life by emery adams allen and s c ferguson Section 71. Husband and Wife The true marriage is the result of years of mutual endeavor to please, and comes of patient efforts to learn each other's disposition and taste. This can be done by all who cherish right views of the duties and pleasures of the marriage relation. You have but one life to live and no amount of money or influence or fame can pay you for a life of unhappiness you cannot afford to quarrel with one another you cannot afford to cherish a single thought to harbor a single desire to gratify a single passion nor indulge a single selfish feeling that will tend to make this union anything but a source of happiness to you so it becomes you at starting to have a perfect understanding with one another it becomes you to resolve that you will be happy together at any rate or that if you suffer it shall be from the same cause and in perfect sympathy 
you are not to let any human being step between you under any circumstances human character by a wise provision of providence is infinitely varied and there are not two individuals in existence so entirely alike in their tastes habits of thought and natural aptitude that they can keep step with one another over all the rough places in the journey of life there must be a leaning to one another the compromise cannot be all on one side you can be happy together if you will but the agreement to be happy must be mutual draw your souls together and closer together from year to year get all obstacles out of the way just as soon as one arises attend to it and get rid of it at last they will all disappear you will have become wanted to one another's habits and frames of mind and peculiarities of disposition and love respect and charity will take care of the rest if you observe faults in your companion keep them to yourself what right have you who should be the very one to kindly conceal faults to inform others of their presence neither father nor mother neither brother nor sister have any right to be informed of the secrets of your domestic life a husband and wife have no business to tell one another's faults to anybody but themselves they can not do it without shame their grievances are to be settled in private between themselves and in all public places and among friends they are to preserve towards one another that nice consideration and entire respectfulness which their relations enjoin with a true wife the husband's faults should be secret a wife forgets when she condescends to that refuge of weakness a female confident a wife's bosom should be the tomb of her husband's failings and his character far more valuable in her estimation than life happiness between husband and wife can only be secured by that constant tenderness and care of the parties for each other which are based upon warm and demonstrative love the heart demands that the man shall not sit silent reticent and self-absorbed in the midst of his family the wife who forgets to provide for her husband's tastes and wishes renders her home undesirable for him in a word every present and every demonstrative gentleness must reign or else the heart starves there is propriety in all things and though public displays of affection familiarity of touch and half-concealed caresses are always distasteful to men and women of sense yet love is of such a nature that you must give it expression or it languishes there are husbands so cold and formal that they have no kiss or caress for the wives whom they really love there are wives to whom a single demonstration that shall tell to their hearts how inexpressibly pleasant their faces and their society are and how fondly they are loved would be better than untold gold the affection that should link together man and wife is a far holier and more endearing passion than the enthusiasm of young love it may want its gorgeousness or its imaginative character but it is far richer in its attributes it should not call for such daily proofs of existence as is demanded of the lover but it is human to wish for the freshness of morning to continue far into the day and evening true it is vain to expect this but humanity continually wishes for what cannot be and though the glow and sparkle of the morning of love will fade away yet it should be as fades the bewitching charm of morning 
into the quiet splendor of the summer day and though recognizing that exhibitions of tenderness so appropriate for the morning of life are out of place in its noon yet as long as it is human to love so long are exhibitions of it quiet though they may be gratifying to the one beloved we exhort you who are a husband to love your wife even as you love yourself continue through life the same manly tenderness that in youth gained her affections reflect that through your bodily charms may not now be so great as then yet that habit and a thousand acts of kindness have strengthened your mutual friendship devote yourself to her and after the hours of business let the pleasures which you most highly prize be found in her society the true wife wishes to feel sure that she is precious to her husband not useful not valuable not convenient simply but that she is dear to him let her be the recipient of his polite and hearty attentions let her notice that her cares and loves are noticed appreciated and returned her opinions asked her approval sought and her judgment respected in short let her only be loved honored and cherished in fulfillment of the marriage vow and she will be to her husband a well-spring of pleasure we exhort you who are wife to be gentle and considerate to your husband let the influence which you possess over him arise from the mildness of your manner and the discretion of your conduct whilst you are careful to adorn your person with new and clean apparel for no woman can long preserve affections if she is negligent on this point be still more attentive in ornamenting your mind with meekness and peace with cheerfulness and good humor lighten the cares and chase away the vexations to which he is inevitably exposed in his commerce with the world by rendering as far as in your power his home pleasant keep at home let your employment and pleasures be domestic what a man desires in a wife is her companionship sympathy and love the way of life has many dreary places in it a man needs a companion to go with him a man is sometimes overtaken by misfortune he meets with failure and defeat trials and temptation beset him and he needs one to stand by and sympathize all through life through storms and through sunshine conflicts and victory man needs a woman's love let him think upon his duty in return for this love you who have taken a wife from a happy home of kindred hearts and kind companionship have you done what you could to make amends for the loss of those friends and companions remember what your wife was when you took her not from compulsion but from your own choice a choice based on what you then considered her superiority to all others she was young perhaps the idol of her happy home she was as gay and blithe as a lark and the brothers and sisters at her father's cherished her as an object of endearment yet she left all to join her destiny with yours to make your home happy and to do all that woman's ingenuity could do to meet your wishes and to lighten the burdens which might press upon you consult the tastes and disposition of your husband and endeavor to give him high and noble thoughts lofty aims and temporal comforts let the husband see that you really have a strong desire to make him happy and to retain the warmest place in his respect his admiration and his affection enter into all his plans with interest sweeten all his troubles with your sympathy 
make him feel that there is one ear always open to the revelation of his experiences that there is one heart that never misconstrues him that there is one refuge for him in all circumstances and that in all weariness of body and soul there is one warm pillow for his head beneath which a heart is beating with the same unvarying truth and affection though all gladness and sadness as the faithful chronometer suffers no perturbation of its rhythm whether in storm or shine end of section 71 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section number 72 of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S.C. Ferguson. Section 72. Jealousy. Trifles light as air are to the jealous confirmation strongs as proofs of holy writ shakespeare there is no passion more base nor one which seeks to hide itself more than jealousy it is ashamed of itself when it appears it carries its stain and disgrace on its forehead we do not wish to acknowledge it ourselves it is so ignominious but hidden in the character we would be confused and disconcerted if it appeared by which we are convinced of our bad minds and debased courage it is difficult sometimes to distinguish between jealousy and envy for they often run into one another and are blended together the most valid distinction seems to be that jealousy is always personal the envious man desires some good which another possesses the jealous man suspects another of seeking to deprive him of some good that he already possesses jealousy is in many respects preferable to envy since it aims at the preservation of some good which we think belongs to us whereas envy is a frenzy that cannot endure even in idea the good of others jealousy is such a headstrong passion that herein doth consist its danger all the other passions condescend at times to accept the inexorable logic of facts but jealousy looks facts straight in the face, ignores them utterly, and says she knows a great deal better than they can tell her. Jealousy violates contracts, dissolves society, breaks wedlock, betrays friends and neighbors, thinks nobody is good, and that everyone is either doing or designing them an injury. Its rise is in guilt or ill nature. As he that is overrun with the jaundice takes others to be yellow if jealousy were not a hardened offender he must have disappeared ere this by the abuse which poets and moralists have alike delighted to heap upon him yet he still lives and flourishes exerts his influence and displays his power as though he were a favored friend or welcome guest did jealousy always make its appearance in its ordinary form of detraction it would be comparatively speaking harmless but it is surprisingly how many different masks it can assume and how it lurks and tries to conceal itself under some less mean and unlovable quality sometimes it appears 
in the character of injustice sometimes it takes the form of rudeness and want of courtesy occasionally a bitter or sarcastic way of speaking at other times it borrows the garb of a virtue and shows itself under what might be mistaken for humility or sincerity lying coiled up like a serpent under some flower and darting forth its venomous sting where and when you least expect to find it no stronger proof is needed to show how contemptible a fault jealousy is than that no one is willing to acknowledge that they are jealous it is jealousy that is the root and foundation of many offenses but they are charged to other causes jealousy is singular in this every trifling circumstance is regarded as confirming and strengthening the previously aroused suspicions it is a sore curse more than certain and fatal blight to the heart on which it seizes then it can be to those against whom its spite is hurled jealousy is as cruel as the grave not the grave that opens its deep bosom to receive and shelter from further storms the worn and forlorn pilgrim who rejoices exceedingly and is glad when he can find its repose but cruel as the grave is when it yawns and swallows down from the lap of luxury from the summit of fame from the bosom of love the desire of many eyes and hearts among the deadly things upon the earth or the sea or flying through malarial regions few are more noxious than jealousy and of all mad passions there is not one that has a vision more distorted or a more unreasonable fury to the jealous eye white looks black yellow looks green and the very sunshine turns deadly lurid there is no innocence no justice no generosity that is not touched with suspicious save just the jealous person's own once lodged within the heart for life it rules ascendant and alone it sports it in solitude it pants for blood and rivers will not sate its thirst minds strongest in worth and valor stoop to meanness and disgrace before it the meanest soul the weakest it can give courage to beyond the daring of despair no balm can assuage its sting death alone can heal its wound when it has once possessed a man he has no ear but for the tale that falls like molten lead upon his heart in nothing is jealousy more commonly shown than when under the fear that some one will supplant us in the affections of another here it assumes its most malignant form here its greatest distress is wrought the gamester whose last piece is lost the merchant whose whole risk the sea has swallowed up the child whose air bubble has burst may each create a bauble like the former but he whose treasure was in woman's love who trusted as man once trusts and was deceived that hope once gone there is no finding it again no restoring it let not any too rigorously judge the conduct of a jealous woman or a jealous man remember that the manic suffers to be sure the suffering is from selfishness often it is without the shadow of a cause but still it is suffering and it is intense pity it bear with it you may yourself fall into temptation it is said that jealousy is love this is not true for 
through jealousy may be procured by love as ashes set by fire yet jealousy extinguishes love as ashes smother the flame jealousy may exist without love and this is common for jealousy can feed on that which is bitter no less than on that which is sweet and is sustained by pride as often as by affection the unfortunate habit of mind which makes one prone to jealousy cannot be too strenuously fought against it were well to constantly remember that jealousy injures and pains no one so much as the person feeling it it is a self-consuming fire a self-inflicted torment an arrow that falls back and wounds only the archer it becomes one to cultivate a spirit of magnanimity toward all and to strive to allay by every means in his power a too suspicious nature it has been well said that there are occasions on which a man would have to be ashamed of himself not to have been deceived a man to be genuine to himself must believe and be believed must trust and be trusted suspicion is no less an enemy to virtue than to happiness he that is already corrupt is naturally suspicious and he that becomes suspicious will quickly become corrupt suspicion is the child of guilt the virtue of a coward it is a vain and foolish pride which would teach that every one is conspiring against your happiness or has designs on your reputation and business the fact is probably no one is thinking of you yet your jealous disposition magnifies every little circumstance and thus you are continually making yourself unhappy when no real cause exists you are to strive against such an unfortunate disposition at all times and it can be eradicated it is not the liberally educated those who have read much and thought more who are thus suspicious and jealous in disposition but it is the narrow-minded the illiterate and the vulgar end of section seventy two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section seventy three of the golden gems of life this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S.C. Ferguson. Section 73. Regret for of all sad words of tongue or pen the saddest are these it might have been widditer there is not a word in the english tongue which signifies more than the word regret it expresses every degree of pain in the gamut of sorrow from the childish regret for a lost plaything to the remorse which when the sands of life are almost run contemplates a wasted life there are none who have not felt its potency nor age escapes it and such will ever be the case as long as it is human to err but as pain and sickness are the sentinels which guard the life and health of the body so it is regret which keeps conscious alive in man and sustains the moral faculties in the discharge of duty life is full of sorrowful scenes so much that could not have been avoided 
but how much added force there is to sorrow when we reflect that we are to blame that we knew at the time that we were doing wrong that we disregarded the warning voice of conscience contemptuously rejected the proffered advice of others and have nothing to extenuate the keen regret gathered with the harvest of sorrow sown by our own negligence the profoundest sorrow is not brought upon us by the world by its bitterness its malice its injustice or its persecution these indeed affect us and make us wiser more weak or more brave we can if we choose repel the world's wrongs we can laugh at the injuries inflicted upon us and hurl defiance upon them or if we cannot command this spirit we may patiently endure what we do not resent but the sorrows we bring upon ourselves by our own lack of discretion or heedless obstinacy when regret adds its sting then it is that we experience what real sorrow is we can not then repel its attacks with indifference regret is the heart sorrow for past offenses the soul's prompting to better actions have you ever stood by the grave of one dear to you and being compelled to remember how much happier you might have made that life which is now passed beyond your reach has the hasty or unkind word ever come back to you and repeated itself over and over until you would gladly have given a year of your own life to have recalled it and made it as if it never had been let us remember that those who are now living may soon be dead and beware of adding to the things done that ought not to have been done the things undone that ought to have been done many a heart has languished for the tenderness withheld in life but poured out too late in remorse and unveiling regret let us be tender to our friends while they are with us not wait till they are gone to find out their good qualities let us be kind and gentle now and not wait for regret to tell us of duty undone the way of life is so full of occasions that call forth real regret that it would seem that there was little danger of manifesting regret where it was uncalled for and useless yet such spectacles are of daily occurrence when one has done the best he can he should let that fact console him and not give way to causeless regret and a wish that he had done differently under the guiding light of the present it is easy enough to discover the mistakes of the past and it would be easy to make advantageous changes were we allowed to go back and commence anew in the journey of life but alas this is vain what we should do is to learn by reason of regret from the lessons of the past that we become fully fitted for the duties of the present regret if deep and hopeless becomes remorse which settles down over the heart with a crushing weight driving from thence all hope unless indeed the angel of forgiveness brings consolation to the soul there are many walking the earth whose lives are shadowed by some great sorrow to which is added the pain of regret caused by their own heedless and inconsiderate actions with one it is the sorrow of reputation gone some act of folly swept away the fair name founded on years of honest living with another it is the shadow of a grave dark and deep which covers the form of one whose death claimed before he had redressed 
something wrong done careless perhaps with no intention of lasting injury hasty and inconsiderate marriages cause much vain repining and regret the happiness of life is gone the hope of a home endearing companionship are fled because hasty and inconsiderate action was taken where care and study was required of all regrets the remorse that must accompany the closing moments of a misspent life must possess the sharpest sting life and its possibilities allowed to go to waste from a lack of consideration on our part oh that the young would give heed to the warning voice of experience and thus escape the vain regrets of later years to escape regret it is necessary to form the habit of doing your whole duty and avoiding impulsive actions pause before you say a hasty or a cruel thing human life is so uncertain are you sure that you will have a chance to make it right before death will have claimed the object of your momentary anger tears and expressions of regret are of no avail when addressed to cold clay pause before doing a hasty or inconsiderate action it may be of such a nature that you cannot undo its effects it may embitter your whole after life reflection is your good angel give heed to her warning voice how are you spending your life are you living as becomes a man an immortal being are you striving to make the most of life and its possibilities if not be warned in time and turn from your ways when life is nearly ended you will think of the past wonder at your actions and sigh for the days of youth they will not come to you again therefore make the most of them now thus will you spare yourself many vain regrets and your closing days will be days of peace end of section seventy three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 74 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Robinson. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 74 Memory. Lulled in the countless chambers of the brain, our thoughts are linked by many a hidden chain. Awake but one, and lo, what myriads arise! Each stamps its image as the other flies. Pope. Someone has said that of all the gifts with which a beneficent providence has endowed man, the gift of memory is the noblest. Without it, life would be a blank, a dreary void, an inextricable chaos an unlettered page cast upon the vast ocean of uncertainty. Memory is the cabinet of the imagination, the treasury of reason, the registry of conscience, and the council chamber of thought. It is the only paradise we are sure of always possessing. Even our first parents could not be driven out of it. The memory of good actions is the starlight of the soul. Memory tempers prosperity by recalling past distresses, mitigates adversity by bringing up the thoughts of past joys. It controls youth and delights old age. Memory is the golden cord binding all the natural gifts and excellences together. And though it is not wisdom in itself, still it is the primary and fundamental power without which there could be no other intellectual operations. Memory is often accused of treachery and inconsistency when, if inquired into, the fault will be found with the rest of ourselves. Although nature has wisely proportioned the strength and liberality of this gift to various intellects, yet all have it in their power to improve it by classing, by analyzing, and arranging the different subjects which successively occupy their minds. 
By these means, habits of thought and reflection are required, which will materially conduce to the invigorating of the understanding, the improvement of the mind, and the strengthening and correction of the mental powers. A quick and retentive memory, both of words and things, is an invaluable treasure, and may be had by any one who will take the necessary pains. Educators, sometimes in their anxiety to secure a wide range of studies, fail to sufficiently impress on their scholars' minds the value of memory. This memory is one of the most valuable gifts God has bestowed on us, and one of the most mysterious. The more it is called upon to exercise its proper function, the more it is able to do, and there seems to be no limit to its power. It is not what one has learned, but what he remembers and applies that makes him wise. Still, memory should be used as the storehouse, not as a lumber room. The mind must be trained to think as well as remember, and to remember principles and outlines rather than words and sentences. It is an old saying that we forget nothing, as people in fever begin suddenly to talk the language of their infancy. We are stricken by memory sometimes, and old reflections rush back to us as vivid as in the time when they were our daily talk. We think of faces, and they return to us as plainly as when their presence gladdened our eyes and their accents thrilled in our ears. Many an affectation that apparently came to an end and dropped out of life one way or another was only lying dormant. A scent, a note of music, a voice long unheard, the stirring of the summer breeze may startle us with the sudden revival of long-forgotten feelings and thoughts. Memory can glean, but can never renew. It brings us joys, faint as the perfume of the flowers, faded and dried of the summer that is gone. Who is there whose heart is dead to the memories of his childhood days? Old times still upon us, quietly making us young again, even amid the din of business and the whirl of household cares. The careworn face relaxes its tension, and the saddened brow clears for a time as some well-remembered scene rushes through the mind, bringing back the childhood home and the loved faces which met around the daily board. We love to think of days that are past if they were days of happiness, and even experience a sad pleasure in recalling days of sadness. The man or woman who loves to look back upon the direction and counsel of a wise father and a faithful mother will seldom do an unworthy or unjust act. And we find the most degraded at times marveling as to what led them into sin because the remembrance of a happy home is theirs, a home of purity, of a father's and mother's loving counsel and upright example. When sorrow and trial, care and temptation surround us, how often do we gain courage and renewed strength by thinking of the past? The bankrupt loves to think that he started on a fair basis from the cradle. And the worldly woman, who seems plunged in the vortex of fashionable pleasure, stops to think that it was not always thus, that a devoted mother taught her nobler things, and an earnest father bade her live for some real object in life. Just that moment's reflection may sow the seed in which will develop into a life of charity and good works among her fellow mortals. And that condemned criminal? Who knows what memory recalls to his view? Perhaps it was a home from whence the incense of daily prayer ascended to God, where kind words enforced a cheerful obedience to wise counsels. Disturb him not, the influence is holy. Tis memory's voice urging him to final repentance. We love to think of the unbroken circle, the curly heads of the children, in the various dispositions that marked them, the childish employments and aspirations, the mischievous pranks and merited punishment, and the quiet hour when the mother, gathering the little ones about her, told them of the better life to come, and sought earnestly to teach them that here below we live as schoolchildren, gaining an education that shall fit us for the brighter home hereafter. But these thoughts are not altogether of joyous scenes, Change and death appeared on the scene, and strangers came to dwell in the home of our childhood. It is strange what slight things suffice to recall the scenes of childhood. A fallen tree, a house in ruins, a pebbly bank, or the flowers by the wayside arrest our steps and carry the thoughts back to other days. In fancy we again visit the mossy bank by the wayside, where we so often sat for hours drinking in the beauty of the primrose with our eyes, the sheltered glen, darkly green, filled with the perfume of violets that shone in their intense blue like another sky spread upon the earth. 
the laughter of merry voices, all are brought back to memory by the simplest causes. The reminiscences of youth are a trite theme, but it possesses an interest which the world cannot dislodge from our breasts. If all then was not uninterrupted sunshine, yet the clouds flew rapidly by and left no permanent shade behind them, as do those of mature years. From the covenants of friendship then we thought in after days to enjoy the benefits and treasures of love. But the forces of life have driven us asunder and swept away all but the memory of the past. How different the contrast in thoughts and feelings then and now. Then it was the trusting confidence of childhood. Now it is the doubting mind that hath tasted of the world's insincerity. We had faith then, but we have doubts now. The heart must, nay, it has, grown old and is full of cares. It will relate at length the history of its sorrows, but it has few joys to communicate. Memory seldom fails when its office is to show us the tomb of our buried hopes. Joy's recollection is no longer joy, but sorrow's memory is a sorrow still. The memory of past favors is like a rainbow, bright, beautiful, and vivid, but it soon fades away. The memory of injuries is engraved on the heart and remains forever. The course of none has been along so beaten a road that they remember not fondly some resting places in their journey, some turns in their path in which lovely prospects broke in upon them, some plats of green refreshing to their weary feet. Someone has said, Memory is ever active, ever true. Alas, if it were only as easy to forget. Memory is a faithful steward, and holds to view many scenes over which we would fain drop the curtain of oblivion and let the dust of forgetfulness cover them from view. What a relief could we but forget that angry word. The uncalled-for harshness and the passionate outbreak that went unrecalled so long that death intervened. Oh, could we but erase their remembrance. But no, with a retaliative justice memory summons us to review them. Words which can never be recalled, deeds whose effect on others can never be effaced, how they come, one by one, showing us how useless our lives have been, how vain. Still, these memories are friends in disguise, for they are faithful monitors and our experiences ready prompters. How much is spoken which deserves no remembrance, and which does not serve as a single link in one's existence, not calling forth one result for others' weal, or thrilling one chord with nobler impulses. How beautiful to distinguish the pearls in the rush of events, this torrent of scenes, both sad and pleasing. The gift of memory is diversified to different people, some having a taste for history, some for literature, others delight in politics, and so on, through all the different phases of existence, with its diversity of thought and feeling. Memory has been compared to a vast storehouse. How important, then, that we inure the mind to healthful actions instead of feeding it on poisons until it would produce naught but poisonous thoughts. Look at the world of literature and science. Why not delve in its minds of glittering, genuine treasures? Inasmuch as the mind derives much of its pleasures from thoughts of the past, it becomes all to provide, as far as possible, for happy reminiscences. This is the reward of right living. An aged person whose thoughts revert to a life of self-denial and exertion in virtue's ways has a source of happiness, pure and unalloyed, which is denied to him whose guiding rule of life has been selfishness. Memory has a strange power for crowding years into moments. This is observed oft-times when death is about to close the scene. As the sunlight breaks from the clouds and across the hills at the close of a stormy day, lighting up the distant horizon, even so does memory when the light of life is fast disappearing into the darkness of death, break forth and illume the most distant scenes and incidents of past years. And the very clouds of sorrow, which have drifted between, are lighted up with a glorious light. As the soft, clear chimes of the silvery bells at the vesper hour float down on the shadowy wings of evening, even so are the thoughts of old age. They recall scenes past, their memory being all that is left now. It may be the face of a mother, the smile of a sister, a father's kind voice, all stilled by death. 
Many of these thoughts are too sacred to expose to the gaze of the curious. They are their only treasures. Beware of drawing back the curtain which conceals them from your view. End of section 74 Recording by Robert Robinson Section 75 of The Golden Gems of Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson Section 75 Hope Auspicious Hope in thy sweet gardens grow wreaths for each toil, a charm for every woe. All that happens in the world is directly or indirectly brought about by hope. Not a stroke of work would be done were it not in hopes of some glorious reward. It matters not that it generally paves the way to disappointment. Phoenix-like, it rises from its ashes and bids us forget the disappointment of the present in the contemplation of future delights. Hope, then, is the principal antidote which keeps our hearts from bursting under the pressure of evils. Some call hope the manna from heaven that comforts us in all extremities, others the pleasant flatterer that caresses the unhappy with expectations of happiness in the bosom of futurity but if hope be a flatterer she is the most upright of all the flattering parasites since she frequents the poor man's hut as well as the palace of his superiors it is common to all men those who possess nothing more are still cheered by hope when all else fails us hope still abides with us used with a due prudence hope acts as a healthful tonic intemperately indulged as an enervating opiate the vision of future triumph which at first animates exertion if dwelt upon too strongly will usurp the place of the reality and noble objects will be contemplated not for their own inherent worth or with a design of compassing their execution but for the daydreams they engender hope sheds a sweet radiance on the stream of life and never exerts her magic except to our advantage. We seldom attain what she beckons us to pursue, but her deceptions resemble those which the dying husbandman in the fable practised upon his sons, who, by telling them of a hidden mass of wealth which he had buried in his vineyard, led them so carefully to delve the ground that they found indeed a treasure, though not in gold, in wine reasonable hope is endowed with a vigorous principle it sets the head and heart to work and animates one to do his utmost and thus by perpetually pushing and assuring it puts a difficulty out of countenance and makes a seeming impossibility give way human life hath not a surer friend nor many times a greater enemy than hope it is the miserable man's god which in the hardest grip of calamity never fails to yield him beams of comfort it is the presumptuous man's devil which leads him a while in a smooth way and then lets him break his neck on the sudden how many would die did not hope sustain them how many have died by hoping too much this wonder may we find in hope that she is both a flatterer and a true friend true hope is based on energy of character a strong mind always hopes and has always cause to hope because it knows the mutability of human affairs and how slight a circumstance may change the whole course of events such a spirit too rests upon itself it is not confined to partial views or to one particular object and if at last all should be lost it has saved itself its own integrity and worth it is best to hope only for things possible and probable he that hopes too much shall deceive himself at last especially if his industry does not go along with his hopes 
for hope without action is a barren undoer hope awakens courage but despondency is the last of all evils it is the abandonment of good the giving up of the battle of life with dead nothingness when the other emotions are controlled by events hope remains buoyant and undismayed unchanged amidst the most adverse circumstances causes that effect with depression every other emotion appear to give fresh elasticity to hope no oppression can crush its buoyancy from under every weight it rebounds amid the most depressing circumstances it preserves its cheering influence no disappointment can annihilate its power no experience can deter us from listening to its sweet illusions it seems a counterpoise for misfortune an equivalent for every disappointment it springs early into existence it abides through all the changes of life and reaches into the futurity of time in the midst of disappointments it whispers consolation and in all the arduous trials of life it is a strong staff and support if in the warmth of anticipation it prepares the way for the very disappointments to which it afterwards administers relief it must be confessed that in the severer inflictions of adversity which come upon us unlooked for and where previously the voice of sorrow was never heard it then appears like an angel of mercy and frequently assuages the anguish of suffering and wipes the dropping tears from the eyes hope lives in the future but dies in the present its estate is one of expectancy it draws large drafts on a small credit which are seldom honored when presented at the bank of experience but have the rare faculty of passing readily everywhere hope calculates its schemes for a long and durable life presses forward to imaginary points of bliss and grasps at impossibilities and consequently very often ensnares men into beggary ruin and dishonor hope is a great calculator but a poor mathematician its problems are seldom based on true data and their demonstration is more often fictitious than otherwise there is a morality in every true hope which is a source of consolation to all who rightly seek it it is a good angel within that whispers of triumph over evil of the success of good of the victory of truth of the achievement of right it hopeth all things it is a strong ingredient of courage under its guiding light what great events have been wrought to a successful completion it is a friend of virtue its religion is full of glorious anticipations it encourages all things good great and noble it is not surprising when we reflect on the nature of hope that we find it to be such a mainspring to human action it is the parent of all effort and endeavor and every gift of noble origin is breathed upon by hope's perpetual breath it may be said to be the moral engine that moves the world and keeps it in action every true hope which has its object for some great and noble design is an unexpressed prayer which flies on angels wings to the throne of god and returns to the struggling one a precious benison of inspiration to go forth on his errand of good a true hope we can touch somehow through all the lights and shadows of life it is a prophecy fulfilled in part god's earnest money paid into our hands that he will be ready with the whole when we are ready for it it is the sunlight on the hilltop when the valley is dark as death the spirit touching us all through our pilgrimage and then soaring away with us into the blessed life where we may expect either that the fruition will be entirely equal to the hope or that the old glamour will come over us again and beckon us on for ever as the choicest gift heaven has to give hope deferred saith the proverb maketh the heart sick but we are prone to be too dictatorial as to how we enjoy life too positive we must not determine that their fulfilment must come in just the way we wish 
or else we will be miserable in the grief of disappointment it is not for man wholly to determine his steps sometimes what he thinks for his good turns out ill and what he thinks a great evil develops a great blessing in disguise it is folly almost madness to be miserable because things are not as we would have them or because we are disappointed in our plans many of our plans must be defeated for our own good a multitude of little hopes must every day be crushed and now and then a great one but while we may all be wrong in our thoughts of the special form in which our blessing will come we need not fail of the blessing it may be like the mirage shifting from horizon to horizon as we plod wearily along but in the fullness of god's own time we shall reap if we faint not there is always a sadness in the dying of a great hope it is like the setting of the sun the brightness of our life is gone shadows of the evening fall behind us and the world seems but a dim reflection of itself a broader shadow we look forward into the lonely night the soul withdraws itself then stars arise and the night is holy hopes and fears checker human life the one serves to keep us from presumption the other from despair hope is the last thing that dieth in man though it may be deceptive yet it is of this good use to us that while we are travelling through this life it conducts us in an easier and more pleasant way to our journey's end there is no one so fallen but that he may have hopes nor is any so exalted as to be beyond the reach of fears when faith temperance and other celestial powers left the earth says one of the ancient writers hope was the only goddess that stayed behind the man who carries a lantern in a dark night can have friends walking safely by the light of its rays and not be defrauded himself so he who is of cheerful disposition and has the light of hope in his breast can help on many others in this world's darkness not to his own loss but to their gain hope is an anchor to the soul both sure and steadfast that will restrain our frail bark and enable us to outride the storms of time there are so many humiliations in this world the secret is to rise above them to throw off dissatisfaction and to grasp some pleasing hope grateful and beneficial to the mind we are encompassed by illusions and delusions we need the comforting promises of the heart a steadfast faith in the good and true and hopefulness in all things especially futurity hope is rich and glorious and faithfully should it be cultivated let its inspiring influence grow in the heart it will give strength and courage let the cheerful word fall from the lips and the smile play upon the countenance the way of the world is dark enough even to the most favored ones among us why not then gather all the happiness out of life that you can why not strive to cultivate the cheerful hopeful disposition that will enable you to see the silver lining to every cloud by such a course you will do much to assuage the sorrows and to increase the joys and pleasures of life end of section seventy five section seventy six of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S.C. Ferguson. Section 76. Prosperity. Prosperity is the great test of human character. Many are not able to endure prosperity, it is like the light of the sun to a weak eye glorious indeed in itself 
but not proportioned to such an instrument greatness stands upon a precipice and if prosperity carries a man ever so little beyond his poise it overbears and dashes him to pieces moderate prosperity is not only to be hopefully expected as the proper reward of life's exertion but to bring the best human qualities to anything like perfection to fill them with the sweet juices of courtesy and charity prosperity or a modern amount of it is required just as sunshine is needed for the ripening of peaches and apricots but prosperity if it be good for the encouragement of humanity is full of danger as well there is ever a certain languor attending the fullness when the heart has no more to wish it yawns over its possession and the energy of the soul goes out like a flame that has no more to devour a smooth sea never made skilful mariners neither do uninterrupted prosperity and success qualify men for usefulness and happiness the storms of adversity like those of the ocean rouse the faculties and excite the invention prudence and skill of the voyager the martyrs of ancient times embracing their minds to outward calamities acquired a loftiness of purpose and a moral heroism worth a lifetime of softness and security it seems as if man were like the earth it can not bask forever in the sunshine the snows of winter and its frosts must come and work in the ground and mellow it to make it fruitful a man upon whom continuous sunshine falls is like the earth in august he becomes parched hard and close-grained to some men the winter and spring come when they are young others are born in summer and made fit to live only by a winter of sorrow coming to them when they are middle-aged or old but come it must and under its softening influence the mind is fitted for the routine of life and then the warm shining sun of prosperity spreads abroad in the heart its vivifying influence and the best powers of man are developed the way to prosperity is as plain as the way to market it depends chiefly on two words industry and frugality that is waste neither time nor money but make the best use of both without industry and frugality nothing will do and with them everything there is no other way to arrive at a true prosperity it is gained only by diligent application to the business of life the men who may be said to be prosperous are seldom men who have been rocked in the cradle of indulgence or caressed in the lap of luxury but they are men whom necessity has called from the shade of retirement to contend under the scorching rays of the sun with the stern realities of life with all of its vicissitudes many make the mistake of supposing that prosperity and happiness are identical terms the most prosperous are often the most miserable while happiness may dwell with him who every effort has failed provided only that he hath done his best there is therefore a true and a false prosperity much resembling each other but the similarity is in resemblance only for they differ in constitution the one is true and substantial and is the result of a well-lived life its rewards are inward content and surroundings of comfort the enjoyment of the real blessings of life 
and the unfolding of all the better nature of man its imitation is the reward gained by unjust or dishonest means it may have the luster but it lacketh the ring and weight of the true metal it may have the outward adornment but cannot bring its possessor the inward peace of him who hath the former instead of unfolding and expanding the heart of man it hardens it and dries up the better nature engage in one kind of business only and stick to it until you succeed or until your experience shows that you should abandon it a constant hammering will generally drive it home at last so that it can be clinched when a man's undivided attention is centered on one object his mind will be constantly suggesting improvements of value which would escape him were his brain occupied by a dozen different objects at once many a fortune has slipped through a man's fingers because of attention thus engaged there is good sense in the old caution against having too many irons in the fire at once adversity in early life often lays the foundation for further prosperity the hand of adversity is cold but it is the hand of a friend it dispels from the youthful mind the pleasing but vain illusions of untaught fancy and shows that the road to success and prosperity is always a road requiring energetic action to surmount its difficulties there is something sublime in the resolute fixed purpose of him who determines to rise superior to ill fortune at the first entrance upon the estate saith a wise man keep a low sail that thou mayest rise with honor thou canst not decline without shame he that begins where his father ends will generally end where his father began as full ears load and lay corn so does too much fortune bend and break the mind it deserves to be considered too as another advantage that affliction moves pity and reconciles our enemies but prosperity provokes envy and loses us even our friends again adversity is a desolate and abandoned state and as rats and mice forsake a tottering house so do the generality of men forsake him who is cast down by adversity as a consequence he who has never known adversity but is half acquainted with others or with himself and cannot be expected to put forth full measure of his powers the patient conquest of difficulties which rise in the regular and legitimate channels of business and enterprise is not only essential in securing the ultimate prosperity which you seek but it is requisite to prepare your mind for enjoying your prosperity everywhere in human experience as frequently as in nature hardship is essential to ultimate success that magnificent oak was detained twenty years in its upward growth while its roots took a great turn around a boulder by which the tree was anchored to withstand the storms of centuries they who are eminently prosperous or who achieve greatness or even notoriety in any pursuit must expect to make enemies whoever becomes distinguished is sure to be a mark for the malicious spite of those who not deserving success themselves are galled by the merited triumph of the more worthy moreover the opposition which originates in such despicable motives is sure to be of the most unscrupulous character 
hesitating at no iniquity descending to the shabbiest littleness opposition if it is honest and manly is not in itself undesirable it is the whetstone by which a highly tempered nature is polished and sharpened uninterrupted prosperity shows us but one side of the world for as it surrounds us with friends who will tell us only our merits so it silences those enemies from whom alone we can learn our defects end of section seventy six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c